the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory and Open Society University Network welcomes you to a panel discussion, Conversations uh, about Populism. The discussion was inspired by the publication of two proceedings edited by Professor Mirjana Nikolic and Professor Milena Dragicevic-Svetic from the University of Arts in Belgrade. Uh, one is called in Serbian, Medi Kulture i Umetnost u Doba Populizma. It was published in 2018 and focuses on changes in politics, culture and media in the era of populist politics. And uh, the other one is called Situating Populist Politics, Art and Media Nexus. It was published in 2019 and deals with art and media within cult uh, cultural and uh, <clears throat> public policies in response to populist and national demands. The discussion will be concerned with a wide range of topics that show different ways that populist poli uh, political communication is entering the public realm, but even more to what extent arts, culture, and media are influenced by po um, political populism. Before we start, uh, as an introduction, I would like to play a video created within the cost project Populist uh, Political Communication in Europe, the Institute for the Theater, Film, Radio, and Television of the Faculty of Dramatic Arts, University of Arts in Belgrade, including the aforementioned editors and today panelists, uh, was a part of this international cost action. So just a second, I will now have to share my screen. There has been a growth of populism in European politics. Many believe that the key to populist success is connected to the way populism is communicated. To find out if this is true, a large group of researchers from all over Europe have come together to study populism as a communication phenomenon. Populist communication is recognised by certain types of arguments. Common for all types of populist communication is the reference to the will of the people. This is based on a belief that the people share one will. The will of the people is typically contrasted with the will of the corrupt or immoral elite, or various threatening minorities. Do you recognise such populist arguments from the debates where you live? Populist political communication involves three groups. One, the populist politicians and parties. Two, the media. And three, the citizens. To fully understand the effect of populist political communication in our societies, we need to continue investigating populism as a communication phenomenon. For more information, please visit www.populist... So the, that was the introduction video. <clears throat> now I would just like to, uh, just a second. I would like to introduce our first panelist. It's uh, <clears throat> Professor Milena Dragicevic-Sesic. She's a professor emerita and former president of the University of Arts Belgrade, founder of UNESCO chair in Interculturalism, Art Management and Mediation, Professor of Cultural Policy and Cultural Management, guest lecturer at numerous world universities, cultural policy uh, <clears throat> expert and trainer. Research interests comprise cultural policy, cultural management, strategic management, cultural tourism, art activism, alternative art and public space, intercultural dialogue project, media theory and activism published 20 books and more than 200 essays, translated in 17 languages. So now uh, I will give the word to Professor Dagici Cech. In fact, uh, I prepared something that is not uh, directly related to these two books because I thought it would be very conventional to start by presenting texts from the books that are easily accessible and available on Academia Edu on different, uh, different uh, research networks and so on. But one of the topic that is part of political uh, populist communication uh, uh, I would like to stress, which is linked to culture of memory, politics of memory, cultural policy, identity politics in Southeast Europe, and that is monument policy as part of populist policies. Already in the book, we had several texts that were directly or indirectly dealing with the subject, 
but focusing mostly like texts of Irena Shentevska, Tamara Ognevich, Tahina Savic with the TV serial as a communication tool for communicating this media medievalization. It's difficult for me to pronounce this word policies. So I will try to share the screen with you because I think these uh, photos of uh, Illyrianism of uh, antiquization of medievalization are interesting enough to start uh, the debate. We are living in societies, most of us, that uh, of hybrid partocratic stabilocracies are ruling, but this is not the phenomenon that is only shared here in Southeast Europe. It's the same in India, for example, in Brazil, in till recently USA, Poland, Hungary, and so on. With the centralized regimes, raised populist cultural policies are using all available resources. And that is something that is tragic. Autonomy of universities is already totally declined in Turkey, for example, Egypt, in many countries with the populist regimes. But autonomy of cultural sector, of cultural public institution was already taken uh, several years ago and the space of freedom is quite limited. There is no transparency as public media act as state media. Not only I now fo I'm focusing on cultural institutions, on art councils, on ministries of culture, national council of culture, for example, in Serbia and so on. All these institutions, media, so-called independent bodies are usurped seized and uh, nativism had replaced cosmopolitanism and so on. Uh, cultural policy might be again after many years on the crossroads because theoretically we thought that in new democracies we started developing since 2000 in from Croatia till Macedonia uh, policies based on evaluation, policies based on research, so-called evidence-based cultural policy. But today, this is all past tense. All public policies are based on emotions, on so-called taste, will, and um, interest of the common people, and so on. Although it's a very, how it say, uh, a uh, tricky issue because dealing or basing our rhetorics, uh, our politicians are developing certain style that is easily accepted by people, but also it's influencing cultural policy more than any concrete fact, than any kind of expertise, knowledge, and so on. So the public good and public interest had been replaced by wording of national interest. So everyone is asked to provide this kind of actions, of cultural policy actions that will raise enthusiasm of the people, that will raise emotion of the people. So they try to mimic this Bilbao investments, they try to make this kind of, uh, let's say, so-called cheap glamour uh, environment, but in fact, Populism deeply neglects the complex, complexities of social life, the commons, particip real participation of people. Although claiming people, as we saw in this video, they're always forgetting subaltern, oppressed. In our case, for example, it's Roma population. That is the reason that I put this artwork of our colleague Branimir, Branimir Karanovic. Um, they are playing a lot also on the culture of fear, to use this term of Dominique Moisy. Uh, in our case, it's even more because it's again fear 
of the transition process, fear of the loss of identity, and so on. So what public policies are uh, offering, they are offering new construction and reconstruction of identities and looking to create the community, not communities, because in every society, it should be community. It's all top-down policies with their specific poetics and politics of representation that we can see on this photo, one of the monuments that was not even discussed. It was put in oblivion in the very moment of its uh, creation because it was not that much used in that time po uh, political communication because it was raised by government that didn't want to be populist, but in fact, they also used populist tools of communication. So what are the major instruments? Victimization, denials of crime, national megalomania, we were the first, the most uh, ancient. So heritage is reconstructed, but also at the same time, reimagined. And all cultural policies are not even hiddenly, implicitly, but explicitly at based, of course, linked to a major uh, ethnic group with territorially based vision. So uh, the fact that uh, uh, the populist policies are very much linked to the critique of national cultural elites and their presentation of national cultural memory, they are now starting to create new tools like monuments or artwork as a tools that contribute to the recreation of national cultural, uh, cultural uh, memory. Like in Project Skopje 2004, where 80 monuments have been erected to completely uh, recreate even feeling of the people that uh, uh, most 97% of Slavic Maced Northern Macedonians, to use politically correct term now, was feeling uh, in 2008 as Slavic population, while today, 50% of Slavic speaking Macedonians think that they are direct descendants of uh, Alexander the Great and that they have been Slavicized during the process of settlement of Slavic population. So my research basically explored effectiveness of monument policies. Uh, so choosing case studies from each state, so on one side and state ceremonies, but today we will not have, I will uh, soon close. I will just like to show you a few pictures uh, just to start our discussion, uh, I will not present all the results of the research. So basically, in this process of medievalization, what happens, decontextualization of anything that is linked to this, for example, monument, railway station that was the symbol of the modernization of Serbian society, link of the Serbia at the end of the 19th century with Europe, uh, but also with Istanbul and with Asia. Now with this kind of monument, we got the whole square decontextualized and uh, certain politics that should be glorifying uh, Serbian medieval history as more as victorious with the sword than as religious with a cross, but in fact the both. Here we have the antiquization process, how it is seen and realized in uh, Skopje. And uh, I could, of course, bring many more uh, pictures, but I thought this might be uh, sufficient to, because we cannot even imagine that uh, only 15 years ago, this square was still, part of the urbanistic project of Kenzo 
Tange urbanistic minimalism that was a present to Macedonian society after earthquake in 60s. Now, nothing of that. This is one, for example, reaction of unknown artists uh, to the, all this monument policy. It took three days to the city government to realize that this concrete monument was not really planned by themselves, but by the, that's really provocation. So for three days, it's, it stood in public. In Montenegro, there is now a lot of need to self-distancing from uh, Serbian culture. So the alphabet is added with three letters and so on. You see also folkloric uh, monuments are raised, but I, um, I don't have a photos. They also play on their Illyrian, uh, Illyrian past. And at the same time, other part of uh, society, so it's a highly divided society. So populism might work in two senses. One side is playing on Illyrian origin and so on. The other side is playing on a Serbian Orthodox Church and Serbian, uh, um, how would say, origin of the population. And both are playing uh, the same way of communication. And then we have something very extra, which is the uh, projects of Emir Kusturica of imaginary Balkan city, city that never existed. The project, of course, is realized. But this project is also part of this Serbian megalomaniac dream, because what you can see here on the left side as the city, it's incorporating what used to be the Dalmatian architecture on two roofs, not four roofs, which is more Ottoman influence and so on. It's again kind of a vision of Serbian city that can englobe the whole Balkan peninsula. And just not to leave that story, it's a pan-Albanian Illyrian dream and identity. Teuta is raised everywhere, both in Kosovo and in Tirana, together with Ucheka warriors and so on, with uh, monuments to Clinton and so on. But all of that is part of this dream. It's not that EU countries in our neighborhood are uh, not sharing the same dreams, megalomaniac dreams, who was the oldest nation on Balkan Peninsula, who was the more brave nation, and uh, to whom uh, belong certain warriors historical, such as Goce Delce, who, by the way, never was on the horse, but often is represented. I think I might uh, close my, uh, how would say, uh, um, a little expose with this, just I would like to uh, provoke uh, through this very concrete and very small and very narrow presentation of populist policies through memory policies, monument policies as part of cultural policies, how those policies are not really in public interest, how they are in fact doing everything uh, that should uh, raise feelings of hatred among the people that are living in the neighborhoods that is using a lot of historical manipulation and lots of emotional calls to people uh, feeling, offering them this kind of events, opening that are uh, of monuments that are anti-elitist in approach because they're very much open to everyone, etc. So uh, I would say that these Poly monument policies are really showing to what extent 
they are outside of any kind of democratic, participatory, deliberative policies, that they are against the rule of law because most of those monuments are raised without proper permissions of local urbanistic offices and so on. It's just uh, usurpated power, very often not even the power of that city, but of the one man, of one president. That was the case in Macedonia. That is the case in Serbia today. So that I will stop now sharing this uh, PowerPoint. And leave the word to Maria to invite the second panelist, uh, Monica Mokre. Uh, thank you, Professor. Mm, just a second. Um, now I would like to introduce Monica Mokre. She's a, a politi uh, <clears throat> political scientist and serial research associate at the Institute of Cultur uh, Cultural Studies and Theater History of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. She teaches at various uh, universities. Uh, the Webster University Vienna, the University of Music and Performing Arts in Vienna, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, and the University of Arts in Belgrade. Her research fields include cultural pol politics, <clears throat> asylum and migration policies, democracy and the public sphere, and gender politics. So now I would like to ask Professor to unmute herself and... Yeah, you thank you, Maria. Me. Thank you for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, actually, I would like to teach again at the University of Arts in Belgrade, but it was a bit difficult <laughs> during this pandemic times. Um, I will also share my screen. It will be much more boring than what Milena did. This is usual with my presentations. I mean, at least with the PowerPoint ones. Um, but I have some quotations and I think it's easier uh, to see them than just to hear them. Um, what I would like to do is to, to take a bit of a broader view on populism. I also have to confess that it's uh, very much based on my contribution to the book, so I was much lazier than Milena was. Um, and to think about populism uh, from the right as well as from the left and what it means for the political. Um, so this, I guess, this uh, quotation uh, is kind of... Um, can be applied to all forms of populism, right? You have the people, which is somehow good, uh, and you have the elites, uh, which are depriving uh, the people from of their rights, values, identity, or what, whatever have you. Um, this, I think, is, the, is, is a good general uh, uh, definitions, and there are some other aspects uh, to which I will come uh, in, in some minutes. Uh, when we talk about populism today, we rather talk about right-wing populism, and we are well critical uh, of that. Um, however, um, in the 1980s, beginning of the 1980s, for instance, Stuart Hall said um, that this is a problem that the left has lost its populist appeal. Um, and that this has been asserted by the right. And I think it is interesting that somehow how short our historical memory also is in terms of research, that it was this idea, which is a kind of logical, so to say, um, the left are representing the people, the mass of the people, the proletariat, whatever have you. So it's normal that they are the populist ones. Um, Stuart Hall argues at this point that the social democrats officially representing the people reserved so much power and got so far away from the people that they opened up a space for what he's calling authoritarian populism. And I think this is a lot of what we're talking today about right-wing populism is this authoritarian populism, but even then it was Margaret Thatcher, for instance. Huh? Um, Generally still, I think we can see also now there is populism from the right and from the left, for the left mentioning just uh, Syriza and Podemos. Um, and there is one theory which I, I like to use on that uh, by Ernesto Laclau, uh, who wrote the book on populist reason in 2002. Uh, and this is obviously based on his main theoretical ideas saying that um, we have to think about discourses, so it's a radical constructivist uh, theory. So whatever we understand of the world is in discourses which are structured in one way or the other. And the discourse which is 
for a time closed is structured by an empty signifier, a signifier which doesn't have a lot of concrete contents or to look at it from the other uh, side, uh, a signifier which can be filled with many contents. And according to, uh, to, to uh, Laclau, this is what populism is doing very successfully. So you have a signifier like we the people. And everybody more or less can identify with that and can imagine that his or her claims are within this, uh, this, this uh, term we the people or also the term democracy or, or whatever have you. Um, so in his understanding, it is rather a form of political discourse than it is uh, that, than that populism is um, related to concrete contents. So you have the underdog and the power um, and a clear cut frontier um, and a lot of unsatisfied demands, which are then unified in this discourse against whatever it is, against the elites. Huh? Um, and this unification, I think, is another general aspect of populism, namely that populism is always opposed to pluralism, um, which uh, I state now as it is, and I think, I mean, Laclau's point is in a political movement, when you really want to change something, when you want to uh, get people to do something, you need this understanding of unity. You need to um, overlook or play down the necessary plurality. Huh? But this is also obviously one of the big um, dangers of populism, that plurality, in fact, is not really a part of that. Um, yeah, and in this sense also, I mean, somehow in, in, in the sense of Laclau, politics and communication fall together. Uh, in the, it's, it's really all about how you communicate your political claims. Um, and this maybe is also the reason why um, populists are so successful in media. Huh? Um, so this uh, anti-pluralist stance of populism, this was also mentioned by other theoreticians like Jan Werner Müller. And another thing which is very, um, which holds true, I guess, for all forms of populism is that you have a strong leader. Um, and, 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 and again, this is very important in the, for the media. This works very well with a strong uh, leader in the media. Um, and that this strong leader is able to represent the people the masses. You have strong leaders in other movements who, however, do not say that they are really uh, representing like yeah, the majority, let's put it like this. Um, in uh, Milena also mentioned the, 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 the link between populism and authoritarianism. Uh, which I also see frequently. Um, maybe it's not necessary, but I'm not sure. Maybe we can go into discussion with that. What we see, for instance, now in a country like Austria, which has less authoritarian features than, I guess, uh, many countries in the Balkans, is that with this COVID crisis, uh, this became very clear. And there you also have a very clear populist message. We have to save the lives of our citizens, and this is why we can do whatever we are doing. Now, when we look at, uh, when we go uh, start from this understanding of populism, we could ask, or I try to ask for questions. What are the reasons for pop populist successes? Uh, what are the reasons for uh, the success or failure of different forms of populism? What are the limits or what are, what are the alternatives? And finally, are there better and worse forms of populism? Um, so with regard, um, uh, no, sorry, I have to stay there. So with regard to the first question, um, it is ob obviously, especially on the emotional level, as Milena uh, said, that people feel that in fact they are neglected by the elites, by the politicians, that their interests are not represented. Um, and uh, so it is very easy to, to, to get an emotional uh, um, uh, incentive for this form of, of, of thinking about the political and, and of political acting. Um, but again, this can go to the left and the right. I think what we can see in the history of the last, well, decades, several decades, I would say, is that the left kind of lost appeal for the masses of the people, on the one hand, because 
at least in, 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 in Western Europe and the United States, not so sure about other parts of the world. Uh, on the one hand, because the proletariat that this was envisaged by the left lost uh, economic importance, was split up in different, you know, in services, whatever have you. Uh, and on the other hand, as a reaction to that also, leftists tended to rather defend liberal values to think about minorities, about uh, gender equality, uh, sexual liberation. Uh, and we have now this kind of, of frontier between the like the normal citizens, the normal people of a country feeling that they are, that they are neglected by the leftists who are not taking care of them. I mean, it's also, this was also the discourse of Donald Trump that he said, I am the one representing like the people who lost their job in the Midwest because of migration and because of globalization and so on and so forth. Um, there is some plausibility in that. In fact, I would say that the left uh, um, separated itself from uh, a majority of, of, of the population. On the one hand, it's also a bit weird that a billionaire uh, should be the best representative of these interests. Um, with regard to different forms of populism, uh, an, another German political scientist, Philipp Mano, uh, developed a kind of uh, structure or theory about populism in Europe. Um, and his argument is that this is closely linked to economic reasons, to political economy. Uh, so in a nutshell and, and, and uh, very much simplified, what he says is in Northern Europe, uh, there is a fear of migration that the migrants will take away the jobs. So we have this anti-migrant stance, which is a right-wing one. In Southern Europe, uh, in uh, some cases, at least, you rather have the fear of globalization in terms of economic uh, uh, free trade, uh, economic globalization, um, outsourcing of jobs to other countries. And thus, you have rather a left-wing anti-globalization move uh, than this anti-migrant move. Um, yeah. Uh, when we think about the limits of populism and alternatives to populism, I think, and I think this uh, becomes very clear when we see what happens when populist parties get into power uh, and try then to legitimate what they're actually doing there, uh, is that uh, populism works very well, this unifying idea works very well as long as you're in a movement or you're in opposition. When you work within a system, uh, then you have uh, an institutionalist discourse. You must try to disentangle these different claims and then to satisfy them by the system. Um, and so when, uh, and we see that I think now and again, when we have uh, populist parties who get into government, that they really have a problem uh, to, uh, to legitimate what they are doing and to keep the electorate uh, with them. Um, so, uh, one example, uh, I think where one could see that was the, when, when there was the Yellow West uh, movement in uh, France, which clearly took the stance, we are representing the people, we are the people, uh, and Macron tried to, to break up this whole movement by saying we are not the people. You're a minority, which is true when we're talking about numbers. Uh, we really have to ask the people. And then he organized this so-called Grand Debat, the, the great debate, uh, where people were invited to, um, uh, to participate in policymaking in a very limited sense and with many problems, but I don't go into that because it's, it's not our point here. But the point would be that in order to break up such a populist movement, you go into the different claims or vice versa. Uh, if you are not able to do that, then arguably it is difficult for populists to stay in power in, in a democracy, obviously. Um, so uh, uh, what uh, I wanted to say here is uh, that on the one hand, uh, a populist movement can lose its, its momentum, its, its energy when these different claims uh, differentiate themselves again, which happens also in movements. I mean, you have this huge thing with the people and then it starts up usually that you have some kind of struggles and internal problems. Um, and on the other hand, that institution institutionalization of a populist uh, claim is difficult because then you have to, to pick, the differentiate. Um, and somehow it seems to me that this is especially a problem for left-wing uh, populism. So we can talk about that in the discussion if, if you want to, but when you think about Syriza or Podemos, 
Um, we, one can see very clearly where the problems came about here when Syriza tried to find a kind of way in between this big idea, we will not do what the European one, Union wants or what the Troika wants and then had to have compromises or for instance with regard to uh, Podemos when they had to deal with the Catalonia conflict and didn't know actually where the people now are when we have like two people. Now to the uh, last point, are there better and worse uh, forms of populism? Um, one could argue that we have like the, the leftist uh, form of populism is still somehow based on class, whereas the right wing one is based on ethnicity. Both are anti-pluralistic, uh, both are unifying. In a, well, uh, in a theoretical perspective, we could argue a classless society would be one where everybody can be included, whereas ethnically clean means ethnically clean, so it's exclusive, exclusionary by definition. Um, and I brought here another uh, quotation by Slavoj Žižek, uh, who actually um, uh, is in a conflict with Laclau, always has been in a conflict with Laclau, and in this case also because he says, not all these claims are of the same importance or the same value. There is always one struggle which is over determining that, and that's class struggle, well, obviously this is what Žižek says. Um, yeah. So I think uh, concluding that populism is not really avoidable in this broad sense if we, if somebody is really uh, aiming for broad political change. Um, uh, this brings up the question that I would love to discuss with you. Is there a possibility to assess populist movements not due to their the, the structure of populism, the way of communicating, uh, but uh, on, 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 with regard to the contents they have? Um, uh, if it is about a political system and uh, which is upheld and should maybe incrementally changed, um, then populism is useful for propaganda while you are, uh, uh, while we are in an electoral campaign or something like that. Um, but arguably it becomes difficult when it is in the, uh, when populists are in power. And just to mention one last issue that I also would love to discuss is what Milena um, uh, said about monuments, because here also it's interesting. I mean, there are different monument policies now, for instance, uh, coming out with Black Lives Matter um, movement, saying which monuments we should get rid of. And I think this can also be seen as a kind of populism and it would be great to go deeper into that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I would like to introduce Mika Pikonen. He's a professor of cultural policy at the University of uh, Givas Ankila and a docent, uh, docent of socio sociology at the University of Helsinki. He has uh, published nearly se uh, 70 scientific publications, including 25 uh, peer-reviewed articles and 11 monographies and um, uh, coded volumes. His current research interests uh, interest include cultural policy, creative economy, and uh, entrepreneurship, civil security and government, and histories of governance and ethnic minor minorities. Uh, now I would like to ask you to unmute, okay, so. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for the kind intro introduction. And thank you for the previous speakers for your very inspiring words. And I hope I'm not going to repeat too much of what you have already said in your presentations. I have some, some similar kinds of elements in here and some similar kinds of theories that I use when interpreting and trying to analyze the uh, Finnish populist party's rhetorics about culture and cultural policies. And I will now share my screen and my presentation also bases on the article which was on the book so I have been a bit lazy too <laughs> in this sense so it's I have some additions to it I hope you can see it now I'll make it bigger just tell me if you can't see it but it should be there so the uh, title is putting culture back in its place which to my and my colleagues understanding is the number one reason of doing culture policy for these populist parties like 
mainly in Finland, the Finns party, Perussuomalaiset, who is the leading, leading party according to opinion polls at the moment. They just released a new opinion poll this morning and they are way ahead of the social democrats who run in the second place at the moment. And this is about this kind of a brief history about the development of their populism in terms of culture. And this basis on the article, like I said, which I made with my colleague Marie Gass, who is a French born researcher doing um, PhD dissertation at our university, at the University of Uvascula. And she's actually doing a, a pop, um, populism in Finland research per se. I'm just, this is like a side path to my cultural policy research, but I'm interested in, in these kind of ethno-nationalistic ideas, what, they're, what they represent in, in, in the Finns party. But the main question in our text was that how the Finns party understands culture and frames cultural policy in their programs, uh, municipal programs, uh, parliamentary elect election programs, and their general programs. And, and the questions that we tried to tackle were, what does culture mean for the Finns party? So this is a question for the content analysis. And what kind of culture is good and acceptable according to it, according to their significations? And what kinds of culture policies their view on culture promotes and they want to explicitly promote in their programs? And we used content analysis with the addition of some rhetorical analysis of how they actually signify, signify culture and, and culture policies. So what is the brief history of, of party populism in Finnish politics and Finland is that there, there was a agrarian national populist and pro-fascist movements in the 1930s in Finland. Uh, the two biggest ones were called Lapuan Liike and after that was abolished by the state. The same persons who were behind, in that, behind that movement uh, established a new one called Isamalnen Kansanliike, like a national, um, nationalistic national front, <laughs> something like that in English. And uh, <clears throat> but the first actual party, which was which had a uh, members in the parliament with the, this kind of populist tones, uh, more or less explicit tones, was Small Farmers Party. Uh, of Finland, Suomen Pientalon Poikien Puole, and it was established in 1959. And they changed their name to Finnish Rural Party in 1966. And the claim was to stood for the still large rural population and to stand against the urbanization and industrialization in Finland. And they, and they were first openly populist party in Europe, especially after the change of their name. And and they and they had they were the first party to have MPs, and that happened in 1970 when they had their sort of glorious victory in in uh, parliamentary elections in Finland. And the main purpose was also to defend the small farmers, small entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurs, and small entrepreneurship, of course, at the same time, uh, and rural areas against the elites in the big cities, <laughs> and that was explicitly there how they called their main enemies. And the, one of the main enemies was of course the anti-patriot communists of the time in Finland. We had a quite large communist party and a, a radical leftist party at the time in Finland. And they were seen as, as main enemies. So they defended this, the uh, underprivileged population of the dangers of communism in that sense. And <clears throat> then something about the more about the history of party populism in Finnish politics. The Finnish rural party suffered of internal division and finally bankruptcy in 1995. And immediately after that, Timo Soini, who was a former, former, should read there, uh, former party, party member of the FR, FRP, he formed a new party called Perussuomalaiset, and that's the current Finns party. It used to be, the English translation used to be the true Finns, but they were so much criticized because of the name to true Finns that they had to change the name to the to the Finch party, which I don't think it's in, <laughs> in, <laughs> not in any way better than that than the true Finns. But they are claiming to represent the true 
heart of the, the core of the population by the name. And little by little, the party attracted members from different, different relatively small far-right groups, such as Suomen Sisu and Vapauspuolue, which still exist, but they are very small ones because the main uh, figures of those small movements have moved to, to Finns party. Uh, and the big victory that they had was in a parliamentary elections in 2011. They got 19% of the votes and 39 uh, members in the parliament. And after May 2015 elections, they still had, after that elections, they still had a 38 members in the parliament and they went to the government. And that was a kind of a rough time for them because they had to make so many you know, like consensual uh, decisions with the other right-wing parties in Finland, with the moderates and the center party. And it was not, not such a glorious time for them as they have pro probably assumed before going to, to the government as they, as they wished. And so they had to make made consensus decision, decisions with the other parties and that decreased their, their uh, support in opinion polls quite heavily and that led to the, to the split of the party in their June 2017 party meeting where the far right side of the party led by Jussi Hallaho, the current uh, head of the party, took the power or got the power from the, from the party members and the moderate side led by Timo Soini had to leave the party. And since, um, sorry, I have some problems of seeing the text. Since then, the opinion poll present of the opposition, of this opposition party, True Finns, the, or the, the Finns party, has been steadily around 20 in Finland. And now, as I said, they just released the new opinion polls this morning, and they are leading the opinion polls at the moment with 22% of, of support from the uh, voters. And... I'm going to skip the, the sort of bigger history of culture and populism in Finland because it's so historical and goes even to the uh, 19th century. And I'm going to go directly to, to the Finns party and how they understand culture and cultural policy. So the three key themes of their thinking in terms of culture are the following ones. First of all, of course, the Finnish national culture and its national features, national heritage, and so on. Although they name these big themes as they're something to strive for and, and promote in their party politics, they rarely actually say what are the elements where, uh, from which the Finnish national con culture consists of. So they leave the uh, definition of culture very open, which is kind of, I, I think, very typical for the populist parties in, in Europe. And it gives them a sort of a flexibility. I don't know how intended this actually is or not, but they, they are doing this again and again in their programs. They, uh, they directly and explicitly say who are their enemies, but they rarely open up which is their identity or what, what are the elements that the, the Finnish culture comes from. Um, <clears throat> the second important theme is control or prevention of migration or migratory cultures, especially African and Middle Eastern cultures. And of course, the focus nowadays is on Muslim cultures. When they claim their enemies, the, the most often the multicultural enemies are the Muslims or the liberals speaking for multiculturalism in Finland. Uh, and then when it comes to aesthetic dimension of culture, the arts, they try to raise the value and appreciate the national arts. And again, they often leave open what it really means. And at the same time, they try to weaken the position of so-called postmodern arts or abstract arts. And then a little sort of piece of history of how they have understood culture in, the, in their different programs since the uh, establishment of the party in 1995. In the first general pro program in 1995, culture did not play a visible part. They kind of ignored culture mainly. Uh, but the cultural spirit of the program was very Finnish rural party-like. They 
they wanted to, to stand for the underprivileged people, said that it's the, 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 we should cherish the traditional Finnish values, the traditional Finnish patterns without saying what they really mean. Uh, and the attitude towards or on multiculturalism was still fairly moderate, like it has been in, in the Finnish rural party programs. They were not openly racist or anti-migrant, I mean, the Finnish rural party. And this, there was a similar tone in the Finns party first program, party program, the general program. Uh, and they attacked against modern and uh, abstract art a bit. It remained without a closer attention, but however, they said that narrow, this is a quotation, narrow high pro culture uh, is something that needs to be resisted. But in, in 2003 parliamentary elections program, the cultural affairs uh, focus completely on migration. So then the cultural affairs got more attention and the focus was completely on migration and the tone was way more radical than before. And this is a quotation from, from that um, program. So the prerequisite is that immigrants become part of the Finnish people, live according to the laws of our country, give qualified labor input to the creation of our common welfare, adapt our language and culture and the Nordic social and political system. In Finland, we should not tolerate an alien patterns and traditions offensive to human dignity, such as circumcisions, uh, circumcisions violating women's dignity, child marriages and barbarian practices of family honor. So this is a clear attack towards the African Middle Eastern cultures, not openly saying directly that, but it's very, you can, everyone can interpret that, that what do they refer to, to in, with their um, significations here. <clears throat> And the similar rhetorics and goals recur in 2007 parliamentary elections program. The emphasis is on, uh, on the hegemonic position of Finnish culture again, and perhaps even more than before. And the migrant cultures and multiculturalism are represented as threats to Finnish culture, to this unitary Finnish culture, which is never defined very uh, sharply. So, and there's no explicit art critique in 2003 and 2007 programs, but in 2008 municipal program, municipal elections program, there's a section underlining the support to the folk arts and folk art hobbies and the need to increase arts and crafts subject, subjects in schools. So they uh, start actually speaking about the arts dimension or the aesthetic dimension by bringing up the folk, folk art, this, the art that people do for hobbies, not the professional artists, but the folk who want to express their creativity to, to, uh, through uh, artistic hobbies. And the elite culture gets a condemnation again, because it does not serve the majority or the true people. And there's a quotation, we're not willing to support elite culture. We call elite culture such expensive cultural production, which does not interest the majority of the people at all, or which the majority of the inhabitants of municipality are not ready to support. So this is sort of, uh, they're trying to deny the very core principle of Finnish cultural policy, which is this universal principle of, of giving support to all kinds of arts. And, and immigration and immigration policies faced again strong critique in 2008 program. And they say that the reception of refugees from the cultures stranger to us creates unsecure feelings among the native population. And that if the refugees are placed in the municipalities, the refugees should come from the neighboring areas with cultures familiar to Finnish one. Well, the problem is, of course, that we don't get refugees from Sweden, Estonia, or, or Russia. But yeah, this is kind of a very oxymoronic way of, of putting the, the saying the thing. Um, the undeniably dominant position of majority and its culture without uh, 
however, really defining who the majority is or what elements is uh, its culture include, uh, we're still in prevailing position in the program or, or even perhaps more than before. And then in 2011, which was their big victory year, the parliamentary elections, the Finns party uh, was the only party in Finland that gave importance to culture to the extent of dedicating a separate program to it. So they were actually the first program in the 2000s who actually had a cultural policy program in elections. <clears throat> and, uh, and it was also their first specific cultural policy program. Um, the place of this cultural policy program was in the overall uh, municipal, uh, sorry, electoral, electoral program uh, was so special because it was, uh, it came second right after the introduction of the party values and ideology, which meant that they are really trying to put an emphasis on culture. And, and before other topics such as healthcare, economy, immigration policy, and European policy. So they really emphasize the culture here. Mm. And the cultural policy program talks about the party's views on Finnish culture, again, the Finnish language, uh, arts, should be written here, not arta, but arts, uh, the national broadcasting company, and the cultures in the countryside. And it, it was kind of a uh, new thing, new opening towards arts, but again, uh, leaning on the very traditional topics like the rural culture of Finland and the Finnish traditional culture, the national culture, the national arts and so on and so on. And I think this will be the last, this could be the, my last one. And, and I'm stopping after this. So, what are the cornerstones of the Finns party cultural policy after the 2011 and 2015 programs? So the fundamentals and the hierarchies of the Finns party cultural policy are, first of all, that the public support to arts art should direct at popular arts, folk arts and arts and crafts instead of elite art and culture. Nothing new basically in there. Nationally valuable historic art forms should be canonized somehow in arts institutions, but especially in schools. So they're trying to put a really quite a lot of emphasis to the, to the fact that we need more arts and crafts education in schools. We need more lessons and, and hours for that kind of education, but it should be about certain forms of arts, not all arts, of course, the diversity of arts, but the nationally valuable arts. And the alien cultures of the migrants form a threat to the original Finnish culture, which should be clearly placed in the front in culture policy. This is one of the key demands. And the Finnish public broadcasting company should promote Finnish productions and artistic expressions through live streaming and other kinds of programs Giving, uh, giving room for Finnish theater plays, um, concerts, and so on and so on. And the abolition of Swedish as a mandatory subject in schools, we mean Swedish language, of course, here, and the de uh, defense and preservation of the Finnish language and finno ukrit languages, especially Karelian languages mentioned. But I think this is all from, from my side. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we heard from two of the authors from the uh, from one of the books we were mentioning. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Maria Nipkovic. He's a research fellow at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. In his research, Marian focuses on problems of contemporary social theory and philosophy. The, philosophy. the primary area of his interest is critical theory uh, as an interdisciplinary approach that synthesizes social and political philosophical reflection with empirical social research. Marian's work centers around the analysis of the potential of different varieties, varieties of contemporary critical theory for conceptual, uh, conceptualiza conceptualization and diagnosti uh, diagnostic, diagnosticizing complex uh, forms of social domination in the era or neoliberal revolution. 
So. Uh, thanks very much, Maria. And uh, thanks also to the presenters and their very interesting presentations and very interesting volumes, of course, which were very, very inspiring to read. And um, as a kind of external commentator, I would just like to offer a few very short remarks on uh, um, some of the chapters, uh, primarily Monika Mokres and, and Nikola Mladenovic's chapters in the English volume. And these, these remarks uh, uh, concern some possible reasons behind the success of right-wing populism and the relative lack of success, on the other hand, of left-wing populism. So, um, and we can, of course, discuss that later on because these remarks are very, very tentative. Uh, I, was, I was struck by Monica Mokra's example of the Catalan independence referendum in her chapter and the incapacity of Podemos to integrate uh, this normative claim, the claim to Catalan independence into its process of articulating the people in, in Laclau's sense of constructing a series of chains of equivalence that in the end establish a kind of new universality, a new, a new people. Uh, and uh, while I was reading this, some other examples came to my mind, which also concern left-wing populism, uh, namely Jeremy Corbyn and, and the Brexit issue and how uh, Corbyn's movement also failed to incorporate the normative demand for Brexit into its process of articulation and how ultimately that led to its demise as well. And then we can also say that perhaps Syriza uh, faced a similar challenge with its incapacity to integrate the normative demand for leaving the Eurozone into its process of articulating the people uh, and uh, a series of, of chains of equivalence collapsed as a result of this. So um, uh, this ties in with uh, Nikola Majenovic Zizekian argument from his chapter that populism brings the opposition to the point of contradictory consciousness that leads to inactivity. Um, in this case, it is the right-wing populism that has brought left-wing populism to, to a contradictory consciousness. And all these three left-wing populist projects, uh, Syriza, Corbyn's Labour and, and Podemos were caught precisely in such contradictions. So um, my question would be, are there some non-contingent structural reasons for these failures of the left, of left-wing populism? And my tentative answer could be that perhaps classical critical theory, so classical Frankfurt School critical theory, could help us um, orient ourselves on this issue and perhaps expand this Laclau Zizek perspective on, that has been articulated in this volume to some extent. Um, and I would then start with, with a quote uh, from Laclau's and Mouffe's hegemony and socialist strategy that Monica Mokri uses in her chapter, namely, uh, quote, while the social is the field of sedimented articulatory practices understood as objectivity, the political is the reactivation of the contingent nature of this subjectivity. To me, this is a very, very fruitful definition of, of the political. And um, then, of course, uh, Mokre as well uh, presented Zizek's critique of this perspective, uh, which says that uh, there is one element, namely the class struggle, which overdetermines the horizon of the whole struggle for hegemony and structures in advance the political terrain. Now, uh, this is very interesting, but uh, it has to be elaborated a little bit. Um, I, would, I would agree with Zizek, except I would uh, um, add that it is not just the class struggle, but it is uh, first and foremost, the very basic um, properties or structures of capitalism, the social forms it, it creates, and above all, the process of commodification that overdetermines the political horizon. Since this process produces a historically specific form of social objectivity, uh, the commodity form, and it does not produce it through the process of polit political articulation exactly. It produces this form of objectivity uh, more, uh, let's say, through the systemic logic, to use a term of Jürgen Habermas, 
the systemic logic of capitalism, the, the logic of interweaving unintended consequences of individual human actions. And it does that through the principle of exchange. Uh, the fundamental principle of capitalist social formation that creates universality in the form of exchangeability by emptying particular phenomena of their unique contents. So um, classical critical theory would thus argue that capitalism creates a kind of social reality that rests on the fundamental opposition of universality, which is something empty, something procedural, and particularity, which is inherently something substantive. And we as capitalist subjects are deeply conditioned to think in this way. Now, what is then the problem with the left-wing populist project? Uh, be, uh, in light of the distinction that Laclau makes himself between the discourse of institutionalism and the discourse of populism that we already heard from, from Monica Mokre. Well, the problem I would argue is that left-wing populism in fact aims to synthesize the logic of populism and the logic of institutionalist discourse. Left-wing populism tries to construct what might be termed a substantive universality, which I would argue in capitalist society is a contradiction in terms. Uh, so left-wing populism needs precisely uh, to fully reactivate the contingent nature of social objectivity, in Laclau's words, to create a people. It needs to create a universality that is internally differentiated, but which at the same time follows the populist logic in the sense that it functions as pars pro toto, as uh, one part of the community posing as the totality of the community. And this is why left-wing populism could be seen as inherently impossible or self-defeating under capitalist conditions, and Podemos and the Catalan independence referendum is one example, and Corbyn and Syriza could be other examples. So Podemos could not integrate the claim for Catalan independence into its articulation of the people because of the qualitatively different kind of this normative claim uh, from the traditional internationalist normative claims of the left, which figure in other chains of equivalence because this kind of normative claim is of an inherently restricted nature, we can say that way. Uh, um, it um, strives for some form of self-limitation. It strives for some form of closure, which is a qualitatively different kind of normative claim from the leftist internationalism. And this kind of heterogeneity that, is, that, that must be internal to a left-wing construction of the people is impossible in capitalism, it's incompatible. It, it is compatible with institutionalist discourse of procedural liberalism. It is compatible with procedural universalism, but it is not compatible with the logic of populism. And then you could say Corbyn's movement could not integrate the issue of Brexit, a legitimate uh, leftist normative claim for the same reasons. And Syriza could not integrate the demand for leaving the Eurozone for the same reasons, because these normative demands were all of a qualitatively different kind and would require a kind of institutionalist discourse to reconcile them with the other normative claims that were in the process of articulation. Um, so um, it seems to me that, that um, left-wing populism, if we apply the critical theoretic prism for trying to understand it, is inherently contradictory and that uh, it creates a kind of political impasse, this, this condition. But then, uh, since these two volumes are to a large extent devoted to art and its potential to oppose right-wing populism, which is much more compatible with, with a capitalist social reality, it creates a homogenous, non-contradictory people, uh, which is perfectly compatible with, the, principle, with, with, with uh, the, the way the principle of exchange structures social reality along the distinction between abstract universality and concrete particularity. Uh, art has a potential to challenge processes of commodification. And this was also, of course, theorized by, by early critical theory, primarily by Adorno. But then, of course, it is also a powerful instrument of the reproduction of capitalism. And then, of course, what comes to mind immediately is Pierre Bourdieu and his theory of art as a powerful tool for normalizing contingent societal hierarchies and inequalities. Now, I, since there is not much time, I would just like to conclude by saying that, in my opinion, art is both of these at the same time. 
it's a dialectical phenomenon and therefore we still need it we still need non-commodified um, art uh, some of this some of this art is to be found in this volume as well as very fruitful examples of what art can do to subvert the logic of popular right-wing populism and we still need it but we also need it not just to oppose right-wing populism but to try to subvert the ever-expanding process of commodification, which intrinsically restricts the very political terrain. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marian. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, another of my colleagues, Marc Lachance. He defended his PhD at the University of Novi Sad with the title, The Concept of Time in Bergson and Bergson's and Husserl's Philosophy. He accomplished part of his doctoral research in Paris, and as a postdoctoral researcher, he was the guest of the Institute of Ethics in, in Munich. Uh, he is a researcher at the Institute of Philosophy and Social Theory, University of Belgrade. His main research fields of interest are authority and theories of the state, love, and consciousness studies. He's author and or editor of 11 books. His works are published in English, French, German, Serbian, Croatian, Romanian, Slovenian and, and Hungarian. Now, I would like to ask Mike to... Thank you very much. I will face a peculiar challenge while I will be making my comments. First of all, because while I liked many of the papers in both books, Medi Kultura i Umetnost Doba Populisma, and Situating Populist Politics and media nexus, I cannot agree with some of the overall general preconceptions. Namely, I do not think that we live in the age of populism, doba populism. Unfortunately, there is an enormous conceptual chaos surrounding the term populism. Perhaps it is not merely that the term often behaves as a kind of a chameleon, as many authors suggest, by referring to Paul Taggart, but it is even possible that the entire discourse is misguided. The reasons might be disturbingly manifold. First of all, one might make use of certain historical genealogies of populism. For instance, the book written by Thomas Frank, The People Know, offers important insights. It focuses on the long elitistic tradition of anti-populism. But the writings of Anton Jäger are also very important. As a start, his essay entitled The Myth of Populism, published on the Jacobine, might be also useful. Anton Jäger is perhaps uh, more harsh and explicit than Frank, namely he claims that uh, quotation, populism is the transatlantic commentariat's favorite political put down. It's also historically illiterate, end of quotation. As for historical matters, populism did have a precise meaning many decades ago. First of all, it was represented by the populist movement that swept the Southern and Western states in the 1880s and the 18. 90s in the United States of America, first of all, by the anti-monopoly, proto-socialist, Midwestern populist party at the end of the century. Their program was very simple, nationalize the railroads, get rid of the gold standard, and root out political corruption. That was it, no cultural issues. By the way, in 1896, much of their platform was appropriated by the Democratic Party. Almost needless to say, there were many similar movements around the globe, including the Russian Narodniks, the Hungarian Nepi Mozgalom popular movement, movements in Netherlands, Denmark, France, Italy, and so on. Taken all together, populism was a strongly egalitarian movement promoting agrarian cooperatives and trade unions with an implicit or explicit distance towards abstract state mechanisms or the self polarization of capital. The motto of the Populist Party was the democracy of producers. 
it is more demanding to reconstruct how did the term populism become a taboo? Yes, there are only a few people who identify themselves as populists. Perhaps Jimmy Carter was the last truly important politician who identified himself as a populist. In other words, it, in, it needs a serious effort to reconstruct how did populism become to be interpreted as an ideology with full nativist order. Today, populism is often a name that we give to mass movements that are bigoted and irrational, that threaten democracy's norms. This meta discourse on populism is mostly characterized by the ambient disdain for normal people by some technocratic or cultural elites, for instance, in the name of meritocracy's annoyance with outsiders. As Thomas Frank puts it, for this kind of meta, meta discourse, populism represented the denial of the expertise of the elites. It rejected allegedly legitimate hierarchies along with wrongful ones. So why did populism become one of the most fashionable words in certain streams of contemporary politics used by so many throughout uh, these years from Barroso to Obama and to political analysts? It is not impossible to reconstruct the semantic changes of populism. The present day image of populism was cemented by Richard Hofstadter, one of the founding historians of the liberal consensus in the United States. In the 1950s and 60s, Hofstadter and other liberal thinkers began to equate, to equate uh, agrarian populism of the 1890s with the demagogic McCarthyism of the 1950s. 50s, Hofstadter painted a picture of populism as inherently conspiratorial and proto-totalitarian according to his description about the paranoid style of American pop politics. While earlier progressive historians described populists as the last representatives of the great Jeffersonian tradition, that is as the last bulwark against corporate capitalism, maintaining the settler spirit and fighting the United States drift from Republic to empire, Hofstadter, Daniel Bell and others in the 60s began, began to describe 19th century farmers as culturally nostalgic citizens who refuse to accept the necessities of market society. There was a huge debate around Hofstadter's thesis and many historians argued against it. Walter Nugent, John Hicks, and Comer Van Woodward. It was convincingly argued that Hofstadter's thesis is empirically simply unjustifiable. However, Hofstadter's thesis is still alive and well in European debates. At the beginning, it was accepted, especially in France, for instance, by Pierre André Taguieff, who introduced the term national populisme. It was embraced by late modernization theorists and others in the academia and, of course, journalists quickly embraced the innovation enthusiastically. There was a funny case in the early 90s. Jean-Marie Le Pen was asked by a journalist whether he is a populist. What is pop? He, he will come back for sure. <laughs> he probably just by mistake uh, clicked on exit. Uh, okay, I will. Or, or there is a problem with his internet. Um, I hope it's not that. So, Professor Mirjana Nikolic is um, a full time uh, professor at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts in Belgrade and acting director of University of Arts in Belgrade. She was director of the Institute for Theater, Film, Radio and Television and the editor-in-chief of the peer review journal Ontology of Essays of Faculty of Dramatic Arts. The main areas of her interests are media studies, management of media and media ethics. She has published three books, either of the over Belgrade, Radio in Serbia from 1924 till 
1941 and broke, broke, <clears throat> broadcasting in Serbia during the Second World War. Over 30 scientific and uh, professional articles for national and international journals and has been a co-editor of a number of thematic monographies. So now I give you. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks all for very inspiring presentation and this little deb debate. Also, thanks the Institute of uh, Philosophy and Social, uh, so Social Theory, University of Belgrade for this event. Um, for the end, my topic is related to media populism, to current situation and possibly recommendation for overcoming it, what is very, very hard. Uh, political populism can be seen as a phenomena which is present at the same time in highly developed European countries, countries which have a long democratic tradition, but also for countries which have passed or passing the process of transition. It is unclear how come uh, these development different countries and society have not become immune to the populistic rhetoric of the politician through the process of this establishment and this rhetoric survives and stay with the same intensity. The media are very important allay in the promotion of political ideas. Whether we talk about a traditional or new digital media, uh, throughout its history, it has been exposed to the strong influence of, the, of politics and economy, served as political battleground and has been continually exposed to market challenges. Regardless of the numerous attempts to limit the influence of politics and big capital over the media through laws, the total neutrality and independence of the media system has never been full achieved. In accordance uh, to the new technological prospects, digitalization, interactivity, hypertext, personalization, explosion of the internet as a mass media, uh, the development of the, the electronic media and media in general has given a new dimension of the media communication. Despite many predictions that digitalization would help to meet the specific interest of the audience and contribute to the fight against populism, it is obvious the digital media and the internet have given rise to sensation, tabloidization, manipulation, and finally populist discourse. The democratic poten potential of the media has never been stronger, but on the other hand, it suffered the most brutal and banal pola polarization with the goal to promote political idea and to uh, uh, strain to consolidate the popularity and influence of the holder of political power or those who are uh, inspiring toward that. This trend is especially dangerous when used in public media, which must be um, social responsible and accordance with the public interest and which open their media space to political populism and distorted uh, representation of the reality. Also, we should uh, easily look away from the uh, manipulation of uh, public rhetoric of the commercial media, whose ethical dimension should be uh, prone to social and ethical valorization. At a time when the media are under great pressure from politicians and their tendency to place their populist idea through the media, the question is how the media can opposite it. The media can respond in multiple ways by creating new media, media policy that are in line with the contemporary politic, economy, and technological challenges. Strong affirmation of media independence, uh, regulation bodies and their uh, consistent uh, autonomous and impartial functioning, uh, functioning as well as choosing the most competent and apolitical member of those structures. Selection, re respect and consist application of ethical 
or codes of the media with clear sanction for non-compliance of their provisions. It is also very important to, ma to maintain and apply special codes of ethics for public service. Ensuring stable financing of the media and the application of certain tax ad in order to improve their economic position, which will result in a, re a reduction of the dependence of media workers of the politican, uh, on the political economic reality, strengthening the media self-regulation or co-regulation, improving the trade union and protection of media workers, applying the strong social initiative in improving media literacy in general, in general, but especially targeted to young people, making clear distinction between, uh, between connect which poses propaganda and promoting character of this, which are being used for political promotion. Um, we speak about uh, politicians, uh, populist, it's clear that they always, uh, through media narrative, present an utopian reality picture. How should we recognize and prevent uh, those influences? The answer is simple, very hard, because some of these possible solutions are in conflict with the democratic principles, but some possibilities could be uh, developing the political culture and raising civil awareness, raising the general education and specifically political media, culture, education and literacy, introducing code of ethics in the political sphere, which is not followed can result in this uh, disbearing the, po uh, the politician from their political activities. Criticizing through media and excommunicating on or, or ignoring politi politic politicians uh, which use hate speech and populist language, improving the better control of the funding of political parties and sanctioning the unprofessional and hidden bonds that may occur between politicians and media workers. In conclusion, as long as uh, the society Ob uh, obsession with politicians and politics from local to global level exist, the less there is chance that uh, society can improve non on, uh, not only in the political and media sphere, but as a society in general. Societies with a long democratic tradition can maybe up a bit about their chances, but ex-communist and uh, society in transition are very slow in progressing, which has been uh, prevent in praxis in the field of politics and, well as, uh, and um, as well as in the media field. An example of this thesis can be spotted in the political and media campaign, campaign from the president election in Serbia, which will take place on 2nd April um, 2017 in which uh, is paradigmatic example of the combinating of political and media populism, especially from the politician in serfs and which are battling to stay in the in the spotlight. It is spot, um, uh, in this spot we can see one simple common airplane flight, but in this airplane between other passengers are one especially travel. At the moment, actually prime minister and president candidate. In spot, we can see a conflict and, uh, and battle between pilot and co-pilot who will be the main person responsible for fight. Passenger on the panic began to, uh, 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 on the plane began to panic. Then, like Deus Ex Machina, become the main actor of this spot and political life in Serbia, um, Aleksandar Vucic, ex-Prime Minister. With huge rhetorical skill, Prime Minister Vucic tell us that only a single managing of country can be stable. The leader can be only one, he. I suggest to watch this video and thank you for uh, this uh, attention. <laughs> Ili ne, 
Možda ćemo izabrati neku drugu destinaciju. Nećemo, idemo mojim putem. Mojim putem. Nećemo, mojim putem. Hoćemo, idemo mojim putem. Ovo bi moglo da bude najgora noć na mora. Naša zemlja, kao i ovaj avion, poverena je na upravljanje dvojici ljudi, predsedniku i premijeru. Iako ta dva čoveka vode državu u različitim pravcima, nećemo moći da očuvamo stabilan kurs koji trenutno imamo. Dobro rečeno. Thank you. And this is uh, and this is the point of my presentation. Um, uh, the leader can be only one he. Thank you. Uh, now Ma Mark is back. I'm glad to announce. So Mark, would you like to finish your presentation? Uh, where did I stop from your point of view? Uh, I don't know exact uh, sentence, but it was a while ago. <laughs> Did you continue talking? Tagiev, just... uh -huh. okay, 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 okay. Uh, did you hear about the funny case with Jean-Marie Le Pen? I yes. Think yes. Very okay, uh, what about Stuart Hall? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, let me continue. Thank you very much for your patience. However, there is another intellectual heritage of today's usage of the term. Namely, Stuart Hall introduced the term authoritarian populism in 1978 by relying on the theories of Pulantzas and Laclau. Obviously, the term referred to something very specific. First of all, to neoliberal Thatcherism that affirm, affirmed an ideological matrix that was relying on the alleged British common sense, its attack against the social democratic state, but also by referring to the Thatcherist emphasis on law and order. That partially resonates with the, with the expressions of certain contemporary analysis, analysts. For instance, Whelan spoke of neoliberal populism and Frank used the term market populism. However, this usage of the word is also part of the overall symptom. Populism is in fact a floating signifier that can refer almost to anything. Already in the 70s, populism covered Hitler, Argentina under Peron, Brazil under Vargas, the Peruvian military government under Velasco, Jamaica under Bustamante and so on. Today, the terminology is even more chaotic. Populism can, in principle, for many, be anything that doesn't meet mainstream liberal pro-Western expectations. This is why in a strange way, for instance, in Greece, both the moderately leftist Syriza and the post-fascist or proto-fascist Golden Dawn were described as populist. What is more surprising is that politicians who are very clearly not populist, at least not in the original precise sense, are uncritically described as populist. Such is the, such is the case with Viktor Orban in Hungary. My dear friend, Gaspar Miklós Tamás wrote an article entitled, Populism Does Not Exist. According to him, but also according to some other leftist analysts, Orban is the par excellence anti-populist. He spent most of his life as a leading politician in the Hungarian parliament. He is outsourcing public goods to Hungarian elites and to the Hungarian deep state all the time. His politics is very clearly neoliberal, very harmful to poor people, to unemployed people, to the Roma population, to the health system and to public education. As Kaspar Miklos Tamás puts it, Preferring soccer and using folklorish formulas do not make someone a populist. The case of Donald Trump is very similar. 
it may be argued that his politics is overtly anti-populist. He did not introduce uh, egalitarian redistributive measures. On the contrary, his budget plan reduced social expenses, especially for the poorest layer of the society. His economic consultants were, were from the most influential neoliberal think tanks. He reduced corporate taxes and so on and so on. To sum it up, there is a large chaos and confusion with regard to populism. It is misguiding to equate populism with ideologies and ideas that had otherwise a very precise meaning, at least earlier. No, mere demagogy is not populism. No, mere economic protectionism, such as the Trumpist one, is not populism. No, ethnicism and nationalism is not the same as populism. No, racism, Hatred towards others, migrants, for instance, is not populism. No, mere anti-cosmopolitism or anti-Western sentiments are not automatically populist. No, the mere struggle for popular consent is not populism by itself. It is simply a characteristics of democratic politics as such. No, the authoritarian exploitation of media communication is not populism by itself. No, mere amateurish or dilettant politics or anti-intellectualism is not by itself populist. No, the mere allusion to the popular will to vox populi is not necessarily populist. And no, the mere Schmittian distinction of friends and enemies and its practical approaches are not populist per se. On the contrary, let me take, uh, let me take the most extreme example, Hitler, who is allegedly a populist, even according to the books we are talking about. However, Hitler is not a populist at all. On the contrary, there is a wonderful book written by Ishai Landa entitled Fascism and the Masses, the revolt against the last humans that convincingly argues that fascism, Nazism despised the Nazis in an elitistic way. Perhaps it was sometimes referring to the folk. However, both in its theory and in its practice, it was eminently anti-populist. Let me summarize my conclusions. The term populism is much more a discursive symptom, an explanandum rather than an explanance. I think that populism does exist. It is an egalitarian ideology that certainly implies some difficulties. There is at least a danger of the undervaluation of structural abstract determinations in the name of an uncritical, excessive anti elitism on the other hand, yes, populism tends to overemphasize popular unity and cross-class alliances to the detriment of pluralism. However, these difficulties do not mean that contemporary authoritarian tendencies such as Orban or Trump should be described as populist. Guillaume Sibertin Blanc proposed a complex term, anti-popular state populism but I tend to be more radical than him. It seems to me that we should generally rethink the category of populism as such. It seems to me that one should either use the original and precise meaning of the term by putting emphasis to the strongly egalitarian dimension of populism, or one should avoid the term systematically. The contemporary Terminological and conceptual chaos does not help our analysis of today's authoritarian regimes. And I sincerely hope that today's populist studies uh, do not attack populism as such because it want, wants to regenerate all time elitistic resent, ressentiment against the profanum vulgus. What was the title of the book of Etienne Balibar, who has received the prize Miladin Zivotic by our institute. La crème de masse, the fear of the masses. There is a rich Western tradition from Plato to Nietzsche and onwards, a tradition of contempt toward lower, lower subaltern classes, the hoi polloi, since ancient times. However, to be democratic means to affirm lay power and originally democracy had to do with the power of poor classes. What is more, Greek democracy was sometimes so anti-meritocratic that political officials were elected 
by sortition or in other words, by lottery. By the way, there is nothing inherently evil in anti-elitism. Let us remind of the rich and diverse tradition that stems from C. Wright Mills, the power elite. Is it possible for populist studies to rethink the contempt towards the people as well? I seriously don't know. Thank you very much for your patience once again. Thank you all. Mark, it's great to have you back. I, can, I cannot believe I'm a lost panelist today. <laughs> But uh, we are all here now, and uh, uh, we have a little bit time left. But I think they won't mind if we stay a little bit longer if you're up for it. Uh, but uh, now uh, we can uh, you can discuss uh, among each other. But uh, also we are open to question uh, to, to questions from the audience. And actually, uh, we have this here uh, Lydia Marinko Pavlovich who asked a question in the in the chat box. Uh, maybe if she wants to uh, ask her question, uh, she can use the, uh, maybe uh, you should use the raise hand option or write in the chat uh, that you want to speak. You don't have to write your question. Uh, but also I would like to ask you if you are uh, asking a question, please turn on your camera because you would be spotlighted and so the panelists can see you. So now first we have the question from one of the pilot panelists. So Mika, would you like to? Yeah, too many buttons, you know, <laughs> like lowering the hand and putting, unmuting myself. And this one goes to Mark. Thank you for the excellent, excellent presentation. And thank you, Miriana, as well. I, I really liked your presentations and kind of alternative way of, of approaching things. And I was just wondering about, can we, use the, can we use the concept of populism and speak about the populistic movements and parties in the case if they themselves call themselves as, as populistic, like, like the true Finns or the, the Finns party in Finland, they openly say that we are populistic and we represent the Vox Populi and they sort of, of course, mix it into their own way by, by uh, adding uh, heritageism, like, like national romanticism and, and na ethno-nationalism to it, but also neoliberalism, like you said about the urban, for instance. It's quite the same way how they understand economic policies, for instance, as the neoliberals do. But can, can we? What do you say? Is it, are we allowed to call them <laughs> populist? Well, my impression is that uh allegedly populist movements or parties very rarely call themselves populist. Maybe, maybe there are a few exceptions, but uh, my impression is that this re really rarely happens because the emphasis is on other things, maybe values, maybe nation, maybe something else. But I'm quite skeptical about this. Mm. Yeah, thanks. And of course, self-description is not necessarily something that has to be accepted by social scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may call yourself a liberal while you are in fact a fascist. You know, this might happen yeah. without any serious difficulties. True, true. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Now we have uh, Philip from the audience, then Monica and uh, Lydia. So first, Philip. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, two questions, one for Mark, another for Marian. Uh, for Mark, I was uh, wondering, I really like the, 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 the presentation. I was wondering how close in, uh, in your view is the discourse on two totalitarianisms to the discourse about two populisms. So you were talking about this um, offensive from the liberal uh, ideological center towards both um, uh, radical uh, left and extreme right. Um, so I was wondering, do you find any connections, discursive connections between the two? And uh, for Marian, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, um, Marian, but also other uh, panelists were talking about this um, um, destruction of pluralism, that populism is actually uh, making uh, societies less plural, right? 
by unifying all these unfulfilled social demands in, in Laclau's terms. Um, in my view, actually, um, I think that um, this unification of uh, different unfulfilled uh, social demands doesn't necessarily need to be seen as the reduction of, of uh, pluralism. To the contrary, plur pluralism uh, remains alive. It just gets an umbrella conceptual articulation, again, in, in Laclau's uh, terms, through um, a demand which um, has managed to empty itself from meaning and, in a way, articulate all these um, unfulfilled social demands. OK, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, well, in general, I think that the genealogy or archaeology of the word totalitarianism is a very complex one. Uh, we often think that uh, post-World War II liberals or conservatives introduced the term in a false way by equating Nazism and fascism with uh, communism that leftists tend to call Stalinism, of course. However, the, the history of the term is uh, much more complex. Uh, a few months ago, for instance, I discovered that council communists before the Second World War already used the term totalitarianism in a very critical way, and they equated Stalinism with, for instance, Hitler's Nazism. So uh, it may be possible that, for instance, ultra leftists use this term in a way that is not uh, confusing or disturbing or misleading. It is in principle possible, but otherwise I think that you are right that there is a similarity between uh, the strategies of anti-totalitarianism that equate uh, radical leftism and radical rightism and uh, the other part, uh, the, the equation of left and uh, right wing populism. Yes, there is a similarity, I agree, but I would be more careful with the term totalitarianism. Uh, right. Um, thanks for the question. Um, well, I wasn't actually talking about pluralism and the destruction of pluralism. Uh, what I was trying, the argument I was trying to make is that um, within the conditions of capitalism and of the kind of social reality it creates, which is fundamentally based on the commodity form and the principle of exchange, uh, also a kind of subjectivity is produced, which uh, conceives of universality as intrinsically an empty phenomenon, a procedural phenomenon, because this is the interiorization of the objective principle of exchange and the kind of social universality it creates into a kind of normative universality. And that under these conditions, um, left-wing populism can appear as an intrinsically contradictory project, but it is still a very valuable project that we have to find a way to defend. That, that's the kind of argument I was trying to make. Why is it contradictory? It is contradictory because it wants to create, a sub, through the process of articulation, a substantive unity of heterogeneous normative claims. And it has it, it, the logic of populism, as far as I, I remember, means that we are trying to create a kind of unity of normative claims which is not purely uh, institutional, which is not purely uh, procedural, but where there is effective identification, right, between different normative claims. So we can effectively, and as Laclau would say, libidinally identify with each other as members of different subgroups with different normative claims. And this, in my opinion, is a very valuable, strategically valuable uh, aspect of the logic of populism on the left. But in trying to create this substantive unity, it tries to create a substantive universality, which appears to capitalist subjects as a contradiction in terms. This is why it faces this kind of huge challenge to integrate heterogeneous normative claims, such as the claim to Catalan independence, 
or the claim to leave, to, to leave the European Union in Britain, the Brexit claim, or the claim to leave the Eurozone in Greece, which all are uh, experienced in, within capitalist social reality as an intrinsically particularistic normative demands, which they are not in fact, with the kind of standard leftist normative claims which are transnationalist and universalist. The, cl the claim to the emancipation of the working class from exploitation uh, and, and other such claims. That's the kind of argument I was making. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Now we have uh, Monica, Lydia, and then Professor Rebicic Rashic. Uh, yeah. Monica? Thank you. Also, two questions to, to Marian and, and Mark. I think Marian. Actually, I have many questions to Marian, but I have to think about them and I will write you an email. But uh, so, one, maybe you answered that even now. Um, it's very plausible what you said, uh, why it is difficult to integrate this left wing populism into like a, a institutionalized uh, framework. But would you agree with LaCloud that it is still necessary to create a movement, to create opposition? I mean, now you said it's strategically well, uh, useful, but uh, what, what LaCloud actually says, it's it's necessary you can't do without that and I would actually agree with him there and also think that especially as you explained it now that it also explains why these movements then very frequently disappear or something like that so anyway this, this would be this like the easiest question to you uh, and then uh, to Mark on the one hand I'm really happy that you came back this cliffhanger would have made me nervous for days so, um, now, I, I, I really get your point, and, and I, I think it is very plausible that it is not populism what we are talking about when we are talking about populism. Uh, still, when we are talking, let's say, about right-wing populism, I mean, do you think that it makes sense to have a common denominator for that, for this, you know, this authoritarian, um, you know what I mean, no? authoritarian regime, person card uh, in combination with like uh, saying that you speak for the masses and so on and so forth, or if it is another term, or should we just avoid this kind of common denominator? Uh, right. Uh, so yes, a very short answer. Of course, we still need that kind of movement. I already tried to, to argue for that in, in the previous answer. Even though it's it's it might be contradictory under conditions of capitalism, it's absolutely necessary. And I was also trying to make this argument that uh, you know, uh, all kinds of social practices which resist and even fight processes of commodification, so including forms of art and engagement through art, are the kind of examples that are made in the books that we are discussing as well, have that definitely can and should complement a project of constructing a left leftist people, right, a differentiated and heterogeneous people. It just seems to me that this attempt in itself is bound to fail if it's not complemented by other forms of engagement, let's call it that in broad terms, which challenge capitalism on various levels of reality that it produces. Well, <clears throat> okay. Of course, I argue that all these phenomena are authoritarian, ethnicist, racist, and so on. There are really a lot of problems with them, but I wouldn't use the term populism in their case. The mere expression, let us be united, is a mere, is mere demagogic rhetoric. I think for populism, it is most important that egalitarianism is its organic part. And as far as these parties or movements or political groups are overtly anti-egalitarian, I sincerely, I wouldn't use the term populism. Okay, if there are no more replies to that, then now uh, I would like to invite uh, Lydia uh, Marinko Pavlovich uh, to ask her question. Lydia, can you hear us? Okay, uh, until uh, I can get to Lydia, maybe Professor Agicevic Rashic could ask her question. I have, ah, Lydia came back. So okay. Let Lydia ask. Just unmute yourself. No, no, un unmute yourself. 
You're muted. Maybe I can. Okay. Do you hear me now? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, uh, I agree with Mark and I have a question for Monica and Mark too. And I would uh, like to ask for your opinion about consensus and dissensus, like concepts. And how do you see the concept, this concept, when it comes to the question public space or institution, institutional space? for artistic or rather political praxis or discourse. Because it seems uh, that populist discourse seek, seeks for uh, consensual practices. But on the other hand, Laclau and move from the position of left populism advocate the censors, I think or agonistic approach in the post-political era, which in the same time allows uh, and heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity phenomena and at the same time plural subject and maybe plural political position now. What do you think about that? So don't you know how I'm about to start? I mean, as I as, as I understand uh, Laclau uh, in this general thing, uh, you have a discourse uh, which is based on equivalences. Equivalences are not the same as uh, identity. Uh, so you have, and this is why you need these empty signifiers. You, so you have, for instance, this very different claim. Okay. Uh, you have these very different uh, claims, which can then be held together by this empty signifier. And the idea would be that I think, and I think this is the democratic part in a way, or the, the open-ended, yeah, or the democratic part um, of this uh, of this uh, concept, um, that a discourse can always be uh, broken up and changed, and this is how it should also work. Uh, so in principle, you have a like you, you have a movement which is based on this empty signifier, we are the people, or something like that, uh, and then when this movement is, this can change and transform itself uh, to other discourses or other movements in a sense, maybe more concrete or, or, or different, very vague or abstract um, concepts. The other thing is that uh, this discourse always also needs an outside. And this is uh, where we have uh, this, this uh, idea also of, of antagonism and agonism. I must confess, I, 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 I work with this old book by Laclau Mouf. I work a lot with Laclau, less with the newer Mouf, because I think this is getting very, um, well, I don't know. Um, it fits very well, let's put it like that, in a in, 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 uh, uh, stress system. But so this would be for me, and, and, and on, a practical, uh, on a practical level, I would say it would be important for leftist movements to deal with conflicts internally without lo losing the unity or getting the unity. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, this is the <laughs> story, you know, that you have all these radical leftist parties of three people who then split up to three parties or something like that, but it's another story. But maybe, Maria, you can you know, it's also address to you. Uh, okay, thank you. Now, uh, if uh, you, Professor, would you, you don't want to ask your question? It was for, for... yes, okay. So we move to... I have, you? in fact, uh, uh, I have several comments. First, the, I will just say what was the question for Mika Pikonen, because he was the only one mentioning the language policy within the populist uh, policies, among populist policies, and I think it's one very important issue throughout the Europe, which is more or less ignored, and in our cases, as monument policies, language policies can also be analyzed and quoted from this angle. But in fact, now I want to thank Marian because of his um, final 
few words, uh, uh, linking arts and artists, both in being used, misused, manipulated, or integrated in populist policies, or being very active in uh, protesting. And that's very good that Lydia Marinkov as the artist uh, took just the word before me, because what I wanted, what we wanted with this uh, book in English, integrating, and I will just, because I think it's fair, read names of those artists that are active in thinking about uh, political populism. Ivan Grubanov, Uros Djuric, Dan Perzhovsky, Tanya Ostojic, Lenka Zelenovic, Mileta Prodanovic, Branko Miliskovic, Sasha Stojanovic, Jael Bartana, Kristina Norman, Zoran Neskovsky, Horke Škart and Horke Star. So the group Škart basically behind and uh, vocal curatorial syndrome. Plus, we have a text of Atzo Dievitz that was dealing with works of Grayson Terry, Anthony Gromley, and Damian Hirst. And that's something that I would really uh, like to achieve, this kind of artistic research and academic scientific research to enter in dialogue. And that's what we tried to achieve with, uh, with uh, this book. Although I have to now say our Serbian philosophy is not like French when you have Deleuze or Gattari or Baudrillard really dealing with arts, and debating, making books and so on. Somehow it seems to me that Serbian philosophy is more socially oriented and discussing big theories, but uh, neglecting arti artists that are really trying to do their best to criticize capitalism, for example, or politics of uh, silencing the labor class present day and so on. Sometimes I feel uh, that their artistic work is even more, I would say, vocal and outspoken than social sciences in general, including my cultural analysis and uh, cultural science. So uh, thank you, Marian, for uh, giving me opportunity to tell this more and to raise attention that the um, uh, work of arts in, uh, presented in this book are equally important as, uh, as texts. And uh, one thing that I thought, uh, uh, I would absolutely endorse Mark in his comments that whatever we are naming, for example, I was naming from Brazil to India, everything as populism, in fact, I was speaking about populist political communication, which is just uh, different from populist policies. In many of those, um, uh, yes, uh, most of those, especially contemporary governments have nothing uh, of populist policies uh, uh, contained as egalitarian policies and so on, but they use all the, everything possible that uh, might relate to political communication, uh, while policies stay extremely authoritarian, neoliberal, anti-egalitarian, making rich more richer, etc., cetera, et cetera. So this is something that we have uh, to be aware and to, but to be really, that's a critique to myself, to be really more attentive how we are using the word populism and how we have to use another paradigm, which is populist political communication or demagogy, but demagogy is, uh, might be also, uh, demagogical rhetorics might be of very different kinds. So that's uh, another, another issue. 
Thank you. Now, uh, Gordana Jovanovic, can you hear us and can you turn on? Okay. And uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? So first uh, of all, thank you very much uh, to the Institute uh, and to all presenters. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, the presentations and discussion. I didn't see uh, the books, so I rely just on what I have heard during this uh, 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 event. Uh, I uh, uh, agree with, uh, with Mark. Uh, with many things uh, he said, but uh, one of the claims he made is uh, also that uh, populism is uh, more explanandum than uh, explanance. So I agree. But then uh, what, uh, uh, what would be, uh, in my opinion, uh, a different project and what, what is missing is actually a cosmopolitan project. It was Milena who mentioned that uh, uh, concept uh, and uh, she put in brackets socialist cosmopolitanism in one of the slides was I, I, I uh, read it. Um, so why it's somehow challenging uh, 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 to, to uh, uh, see that in spite of globalization, in spite of, of appeals to uh, universal procedures, rights, and so on, we are more and more away from conditions and tools and values which would support cosmopolitan uh, uh, project attitudes, values, and so on. And, and uh, um, I appreciate very much uh, Mark's uh, reference to the egalitarian principle, which was originally part of, uh, of populist uh, movements. But uh, 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 it is striking that that principle has been somehow uh, 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 expropriated and misused for other uh, 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 projects and, and actually discredited uh, uh, in that uh, uh, different uh, use. Then I think uh, what, uh, what Marian suggested uh, uh, in his contribution, it seems that uh, uh, indeed uh, capitalism with all its uh, achievements uh, is working against any possibility of developing a cosmopolitan project on egalitarian principle. And uh, uh, the focusing on populism uh, somehow uh, uh, distracts attention from what are the core uh, structures and, and issues. It is, it, is, it is a reaction to many, uh, to many processes and tendencies which uh, uh, um, globalization brought about because globalization doesn't mean that everybody has the same chance not every language has the same uh, chance, not every uh, uh, cultural pattern has the same sign. So it's somehow seducing. Globalization is actually globalization of existing uh, uh, inequalities, dominance, hegemony, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, so in order to, to uh, uh, resist that, I think it is necessary to question globalization and it should not be equated then and discredited if it, is, it, if, if it comes from po uh, nowadays populist movement. I think we should, we need a kind of, of deeper uh, or uh, 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 depth hermeneutics in order to understand uh, the meaning of all messages, which are, of course, contradictory and, and uh, uh, they deserve to be criticized. But somehow, well, in one world, what I'm uh, uh, looking for are cosmopolitan uh, 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 processes or, or, or tendencies or tools or projects, model. So what would you say about that? Thank you very much. So, uh, I, uh, yes, uh, Nebrisha had um, some questions and comments, but it was 
um, a few. So now we realized his internet is not working correctly. So maybe I could. Um, read them so uh, I will start here possibly productive for this topic inside into argumentation of bourgeois society scientist against reason and nature or rioting masses uh, so that is just a reference so sorry Nebush, if you could maybe just write your main um, question I could read that mm. Okay, here it is. What is people? And what is people and what is popular? And uh, do you have in mind the panelist who should answer this? And who is invited to decide about that? But okay. He also said, do academic elite belong to people? Yes, but um, now we need now we need the person who should answer that. <laughs> well, I think actually you need like a one week conference to answer that or to start answering that. <laughs> um, but I mean, I guess that the basic point, at least when you start up, uh, um, Yes. Okay. We could ask for answers. Um, uh, if we start up from from um, from Laclau and not from Polances, maybe also from Polances. I mean, obviously, people is always a construction, huh? and this is the beauty of the term, or the beauty or the charm of the term. This is why you can use and abuse it so easily, um, because I, I mean, we the people can be, you know, we have these things about the demos and the ethnos, and you have to think about the people why versus the elites. Um, so I, I think that it's 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 a one of those uh, empty signifiers, huh? and um, one can obviously, and I think it makes a lot of sense what Mark said that if we talk about populist and people, then we should talk about egalitarianism, which has to do with uh, well, with most people somewhere, uh, and then but then again comes up the question, which is frequently confused: Do we talk about citizens when we talk about the people? Do we talk about everybody in the territory, uh, including non-citizens? Do we talk in a global sense um, and so on and so forth? Uh, and um, so probably this would be another term one should avoid somehow <laughs> because it's so confused. Uh, um, and I wanted to just say one, uh, well, one half sentence to what uh, Gordana said now. Um, I mean, I guess this, this example of globalization and economic globalization shows obviously also, to say that something is is, is populist, um, not in the sense in which Mark uses it, but in the sense in which it's used, otherwise, doesn't say necessarily that this is wrong or that there are not re no reasons for that, and so on and so forth. So, um, and I think this is something we, we should keep in mind also when we work on a political level. Huh? So there are good reasons to be opposed against the form of globalization we have now. There are some, not a lot, but there are some reasons to be afraid uh, for my job or whatever uh, when a lot of migrants come in, not for me as an academic <laughs> probably, maybe also come of the <laughs> academic migrants, but uh, especially for people who are in uh, low skilled jobs uh, and so on and so forth. So. So I, I don't say I don't say this thing that it's always said by by right wing populists we have to uh, take seriously the fears of the people. I think this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But to understand what is going on and what this has to do with a neoliberal uh, capitalist system, I think is well is, is key. Huh? Um, if I can just uh, try to complement what Monica said. Um, uh, and answer Nebuchadnezzar's question. If we follow Laclau's logic, then we could say that uh, the people uh, could be defined as the unity of those social actors who undertake what might be termed the challenging or the reevaluation of the um, object, uh, sum of objectivities, right? As Laclau would call it, of social objectivities and which we could also term institutional realm. So um, uh, that, that's how we could defi define the people. The people is the kind of, of uh, a collective political actor 
who tries to to uh, rearticulate institutional reality. This would be a left kind of populist definition of of the people, and an open one, right? It is open to be expanded and inclusive in its nature, right? Uh, okay, thank you. Now, if there is no more questions, maybe some of you have more questions. Uh, if there is not, because we were here all, all over two hours, so maybe we should take a break and continue these discussions uh, somewhere in the future. Uh, maybe even uh, being all together in the same room. <laughs> So I would like to um, say thank you to my panelists for your presentation and the discussion and also for so many guests who stayed uh, till the end. So thank you all. And uh, I will see you on uh, some other events. Bye.